Welcome to Northgate Bible Chapel Online. Thanks for checking out our podcast, where you can listen to our latest sermons, filled with teaching, encouragement, and hope from God's Word. So whether you're outdoors, in the car, or just poured some coffee, let's dive in to today's message. Good morning. Turn with me, if you would, to uh, Romans chapter 1. Romans, Romans chapter 1. So we will be looking at the book of Romans for the next one year, this, this, this upcoming whole year, Lord willing. In between, we are going to be having open topics uh, as the Lord leads, and also during the summer, we'll take a break with uh, open topics as well. Let's uh, commit our time to the Lord in prayer uh, before we dive into our topic. Father, we thank you again for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins. Father, we thank you that you are not, your son is not in the grave, but rather uh, risen and seated at the right hand of the throne of God, who daily intercedes for us, who daily provides us grace upon grace. And Father, we are sustained by his grace. We are sustained by your grace. We are sustained by your peace and by your love. And what a privilege it is for us uh, to be called the sons of God, children of a holy God of no doing of our own, but what you have done in and through your Son. Help us, Lord, as we open up this epistle uh, to the Church of Rome, that, Lord, uh, that this would speak to us at, at Northgate Bible Chapel, that the gospel of Christ Jesus would be so refreshing to our minds and our hearts as we open up this book, that we would see the love of God, that we would see the grace that he bestows, that we would be mesmerized by our Savior and Lord. Father, we look to you for your help and for your grace this morning. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. We will read from Romans chapter 1 and... uh, we will read from verse 1 to 7. Uh, next week, we will, Lord willing, be looking at uh, verse 8 uh, to verse 17, uh, for j- j- just so that you can be reading in advance. Romans chapter 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through the pro- his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all the nations for his name among whom you are the called of Jesus Christ to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. So this is the letter that Paul wrote uh, to the church uh, that our churches that was in Rome. When you look at Romans chapter 16, you will see uh, multiple saints and multiple small groups that uh, Paul addresses. This is, uh, n- you know, although you have the picture of the Colosseum there, it's uh, not to the uh, Colosseum or to the people uh, that were uh, in there that uh, Paul wrote this letter to, but rather he wrote this letter to the churches a letter to them that were bought by his blood, to give them a perspective of what they were called into. 
not what they were called out of, but rather what they were called into, into Christ Jesus, and the privilege that they had to serve Christ. Paul wrote this letter while he was in Corinth. Uh, again, just a, just a brief background here. Uh, Paul wrote this letter when he was in Corinth uh, on his third missionary journey. Uh, he had not visited the church, churches in Rome as yet. He desired with great zeal to go and visit the churches in Rome, uh, but he hadn't at this point. Now, just a little bit of background related to Rome, uh, just so that you get a perspective of where these churches were uh, with respect to the world that was around them. And when you think about the background associated with Rome, it's no different than how it is today for us. And so uh, we as Northgate Bible Chapel can consider uh, these things uh, that are around us as we look through this background. It was one of the most largest and wealthiest uh, Mediterranean cities in the ancient world. It was the capital of the Gentile world. It was a capital of trade. Uh, it was the center of paganism and immorality. Rome was very heavily influenced with Greek mythology. Uh, a polytheistic um, society um, was not something that uh, they, they looked on as something that was good. Uh, a polytheistic society, um, you know, uh, a, a po you know, the emperor worship was uh, of prominent uh, concern over there. Uh, they looked at their emperors, Nero, they looked at their emperors as Claudius, uh, those that were, uh, you know, uh, worshipped. And that is what the kings in Rome wanted. A, a monotheistic faith was despised. A polytheistic faith was what they had. Um, under Roman Emperor Claudius in AD, AD 49, uh, we read that there were a lot of Jews that were expelled. This was not during the times of Hitler. Uh, yes, during the times of Hitler, uh, Jews uh, were persecuted in and throughout Europe, uh, and especially Eastern Europe. Uh, but then in AD 49, uh, Emperor Claudius sent all these Jews out of Rome and among them also included the faithful uh, Aquila and Priscilla who ministered to the needs of Paul in Corinth. To the point where we would read in, in this episode, Paul talking about, a, you know, a, 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 about Aquila and Priscilla and telling uh, the saints, uh, they put their neck out there for me uh, in the work of the ministry. So again, you see Christians that were persecuted in, this church, in, in, in and around uh, during this time, and so also the Jews. Rome was like a great magnet. It grew men and women from the ends of the world uh, to the center stage, so to speak. Um, the Roman Empire was a dominant political and military force during this biblical time. So in the midst of that stood a candle, a lampstand, so to speak, as uh, the writer in Revelation would put it. In the midst of this stood a mighty lampstand of faith. Small house churches established by the Lord God of heaven by his power. Their faith was spoken of throughout the world, is what we read in, in the book of uh, Romans. Uh, and, and, and the word that is used of Paul there is spoken of throughout the world, their faith, in the sense it was announced, it was declared, it was proclaimed publicly uh, to the entire world. This was uh, a time when they did not have Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat or whatnot. But in the midst of that, their faith was proclaimed throughout the world. And that could have been done none other by the work, uh, none other than by the work of the Holy Spirit. We also read in Romans chapter 16 and verse 19 in that last, uh, last book, uh, last chapter of the book, that their obedience had become known to all. This was not like, uh, okay, you know, there are churches in Rome, but this was a faithful church or churches, so to speak. They persevered on in the midst of persecution 
for the cause of Christ. And their obedience was known to all. You know, and we will look a little more into that uh, as we progress today uh, in this message. Uh, what, is this, uh, what does that tell us today as Northgate Bible Chapel? What does that mean for us today? Romans, uh, the book of Romans, again, is the most complete uh, and systematic presentation of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Very beautifully laid out. Uh, many saints of old, um, uh, uh, Augustine, we know of Martin Luther, uh, the German reformer, uh, we know of uh, John Wesley, all of them that were transformed by the message of the gospel as they read through the book of Romans. There are two major divisions in this book, uh, Romans 1 uh, through Romans 1126, it's more theological, uh, more foundational. And then from Romans 12 to Romans uh, 15, uh, we see the practical side of things. And then uh, in Romans 16, we see Paul greeting the churches and telling them to take heed of, of deceiving spirits that were around. Another primary theme, uh, Again, uh, the primary theme, in fact, not another, but rather the primary theme is the gospel. And what is the gospel? The word gospel means good news. The good news that God declared sinners to be righteous when they trust in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ uh, for their sins. And that is the good news. We who were once unrighteous have been declared as righteous through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, where he paid the penalty of our sins. That is the gospel. And the entire book of Romans permeates that particular theme. We see this progression uh, right from Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, we read, For all have sinned and come short or fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, we read, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, we read, But God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In Romans chapter 10, verse 8, 9 to 10, we read of how we can receive the salvation that God so freely gives. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. And once you are saved in Romans chapter 1, and uh, we will look at that, this in detail next week, we see Paul writing and saying, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation unto all who believe, to the Jews first and also to the Greeks. I'm not ashamed of this gospel that I have believed. So this is the primary theme of of, of the book of Romans, uh, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ our Lord. Another, another theme uh, is the righteousness of God. The word righteousness uh, means equity or justice or integrity. Uh, we, uh, you know, this word is very frequently used not as righteousness in our workforce, but rather as justice or equity or integ integrity. Uh, the idea presented here is a conformity to a standard. Uh, and what is the standard? The Lord God of heaven, the Father above, he is the standard. There is no unrighteousness in him. But there is so much unrighteousness in man because of his sin. Righteousness means to give each man his due based upon his conformity or lack of conformity to the divine standard of perfect holiness, which is God. 
And what is the solution to this? There is the unrighteous man, there is the righteous God, but God makes a provision in and through His Son to make us righteous so that we might be accepted in the Beloved. The righteousness of God. The book of, of Romans is all about this righteousness of God, and we need that righteousness more than anything, and He provides that righteousness through His Son. We read in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, For he, that is God, made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That we might be the righteousness of God in him. What a great transaction. My sin laid upon the Savior, his righteousness, because he is the perfect one, who knew no sin, and his righteousness bestowed upon a wretched sinner like me, so that when the Father looks at me now, I am made accepted in the Beloved because he sees Christ's righteousness bestowed upon me. Hallelujah, what a Savior. So we see the progression of this in the book of, uh, of Romans, in Romans uh, chapter 1 and uh, all the way to chapter 3 and verse 20, we see the need for righteousness. What is the need for righteousness? Uh, in, in, in chapter 3, uh, 21 to chapter 8, we see the provision of righteousness. In chapters uh, 9 to 11, there is a, a small interlude there with respect to the Jewish nation and Israel, and there is the defense of righteousness. And then in the end, Last but not the least, very important to the Christian faith, the practice of righteousness uh, from chapters 12 to chapters 15. Just one more parallel uh, theme that runs throughout the book of Romans is the relationship that God desires uh, between himself and man. At the Garden of Eden, man sinned, and sin came in between, and the relationship was ruined uh, because of sin. There was uh, a failed relationship as a result. Man could not approach God. But through his righteousness now, through his son, uh, he has redeemed us, brought us back into a relationship. And that is the focus here, a restored relationship through the work of Jesus Christ our Lord. So for our portion today, uh, if I were to summarize verses 1 to verses 7 uh, that we just read, it's going to be in this. The gospel is of God. Its center is Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. Its purpose is for His glory and its blessings are for the saints. So uh, maybe we can all say that together. So the gospel is of God, its center is Jesus Christ, its purpose is for his glory, its blessing are for the saints. So when we look at uh, this passage and verse 1, uh, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle separated to the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Who Paul? You know, Paul presents himself, but if you would note, he's not bringing focus on himself, but rather on the one that owns him. Not who Paul was, but whose Paul was. And look at the phrases that are used there by Paul in verse 1. Paul who? Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus. Paul called. Paul separated to. Bondservant called to, separated to. You know, I admire Paul. I often tell Sophie and the girls uh, when 
uh, I go to heaven besides our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the first person I'd like to see is Apostle Paul. And I will be standing with him as my family enters in and welcoming them into the, uh, in, in, <laughs> into the house of God. Like, uh, you know, Paul, I admire Paul a lot. But, but this book of Romans and even the starting of it, it's not about Paul. But it's about who Paul was. Whose is Paul? Who owned Paul? You know, and he uses the word bondservant. And it's very important to focus on that a little bit. A Paul, a bondservant of Christ. The word that is used there is the word doulos. Uh, and, and, and note, if you would, that Paul was first a slave before he was an apostle. He says, I am a, a bondservant. And then he says, uh, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was first a slave before he was an apostle. Paul was not ashamed to address himself as a slave. In, in the midst of 60 million uh, people that were slaves during this time in this uh, part of the world, uh, Paul would very intentionally use that same phrase. And there was a wonderful truth there uh, from the Old Testament about that word bond servant that it was used, or literally, which means a slave. When you look at, again, you don't have to turn here. Uh, I have put all the references out there. When you look at Deuteronomy chapter 15, um, you know, a master, there, was, there are masters and there were servants or slaves. And there was one note in the law of Moses about how the masters had to treat their slaves or treat their servants. And in Deuteronomy chapter 15, uh, there was a caveat there. And that caveat was that in the seventh year, they would be released. They would be released. They would be called freed men. They would be given liberally. They would be given out of the, uh, of, uh, out of the master's field. They would be given uh, out of the wine press. And they would be sent forth. So a lot of a lot of um, servants or slaves looked forward to the seventh year or the Sabbath year, so to speak. But then there were some servants or some slaves that looked at the seventh year in a lot of trepidation and a lot of fear. And why? Uh, they would think about how it was before they were under a very good master. They would think about those days when uh, their economy was very fragile and when they had nothing to eat, when they could not bring home food to the table. And in all these things, uh, some of these slaves and servants would think through these things with their families. Oh, how hard it was, and now I have shelter under a righteous and good master. And so seventh year would come about and they would be a little afraid because now they're going to be let free. They would be given some provisions, but when the provisions run out, what are they going to do? And so there is this truth in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 16, uh, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 15 and verse 16, uh, where they would say, I will not go away from you. This slave or, or servant would come to the master and say, because I love your house and because I have prospered in your house, I will not go. I want to be your servant forever. And so from there, uh, Paul derives this word bond servant, right, or perpetual slave or forever slave. And he chooses that word intentionally uh, to give a glimpse to the church in Rome of who he was. He wanted to remain a slave forever. And, and, and what the, the good master would do would be, they would bring the slave, and after he has made this pro proclamation or co confession uh, to uh, the master, the master would take him. He would take him to the door of the tabernacle. Uh, he would put his uh, ear on the door, and he would uh, take an awl or a sharp pointed thing, and. Uh, put it right through the lobe of his ear. And so now, uh, that was the testament uh, to everyone that saw this servant or slave that this person 
represented the master wherever he went, and this person was that master's. Again, this is all in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 15, uh, if you'd like to look at it. And Paul was saying here um, very, a very similar thing. Paul was saying, I love my master. My master is awesome. I am thine, O Lord, and I'll have it no other way. I am your bondservant. What a privilege it is for you and me uh, to be servants of the living God, um, to serve our Lord as bondservants. Let us not be ashamed of using that word, a bondservant or a slave of Christ Jesus, rather than a slave of sin. Then we see uh, him saying, called to, called to be an apostle. Uh, and, uh, and the word apostle there is one who is sent. One of the requirements of being an apostle was that they had to see the risen Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, those requirements are laid out. And Paul encountered Christ Jesus on the road to Damascus. And again, we see that in Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 9. In the Old Testament, there were prophets that had spoken without being sent. You know, there were prophets that, were, that spoke in, in the book of Jeremiah and, and chapter 29 and verse 9. Uh, in the book of Ezekiel, there were a lot of prophets uh, during that time, uh, true prophets as well as false prophets. Prophets that were sent and called and prophets that were false. So Paul was not like one of these false prophets of old, but one who was personally sent and called to the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ to the Gentile world. Beyond the calling of Paul into the gospel of Christ, Paul was called into a specific purpose, uh, the mission of Christ Jesus, to proclaim his name among the nations, among the Gentiles. Now, you and I are called into a mission, in, uh, into the, you know, we are called by the grace of God, uh, we are called for a purpose. And the purpose is not just to be in attendance every Sunday, uh, no mission is too big or too small for our Lord. Uh, what have you been called into? Maybe we are stuck at a crossroads uh, after a divine encounter with the Lord. Uh, you know, he revealed his mission to Paul. You know, I'm amazed day in, day out of how he made himself known to Paul. He was gracious to reveal his purposes, gracious to reveal who he was to a wretched sinner like Paul, and so it is for, for me. Now, one, one caveat here that I'd like to make, right? Uh, it's not man who sends or commissions uh, saints into the work. You know, you might have the burden to go somewhere, uh, to Zambia or Peru or, or uh, South America somewhere, or wherever it is, or you might be called into service within the local body. Uh, as an elder, as a deacon, or uh, in, in any other ministry that the Lord calls you into. It's not man that sends or commissions saints into his work. It is God. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 37, we read, uh, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. It's the Lord of the harvest that we have to pray to that he would convict and send. And we encourage them on. When you are called of God uh, into the service, whatever it may be, uh, you know, we jump in without reservations and the Lord will equip you. You know, sometimes we are always concerned. Uh, I don't have the skill set. I don't know what I'm going to be preaching. I don't know how to do this. But the Lord, once you are called of God, he equips you. He, he, he gives you everything that is pertinent to life and godliness that is required for the work that he has called you into. And that is to show forth the grace of God. God works through grace and not according to man's abilities, not according to man's merits. And this again, is a, a, a very big theme within the book of Romans. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 15, we read, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, 
to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. It is God who separated Paul unto his work. So again, separated to the gospel. Um, it was not what Paul was separated from, that is the focus here, but it was what Paul was separated to, that is the focus of this passage. If we are truly separated under Christ Jesus, uh, we are automatically separated from all that is opposed to Christ. You know, it's very similar to making a vow on your wedding day. When you look at your bride uh, and you say, in, in, in sickness and in health, in poverty or in wealth, till death do me part, uh, I am yours and you are mine. Uh, there is an implied, there is an implied statement that you are making, although you're not making an explicit statement there, that there is gonna be no other women relationship that you are gonna be part of. The only person that I want is you. And so it is with Christ Jesus. When we come into the saving knowledge of Christ Jesus, into the household of God, all that should fill our hearts and our souls and our minds and our eyes are Christ Jesus. And when that happens, everything that is around us will slowly fade away in the light of his glory and his grace. Separated to the gospel. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, we read, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new in Christ Jesus. So separated to the gospel of God. Separated to the gospel of God, promised through the prophets. The gospel is not of man, but of God. The initiator is God and not man. The source of it is God. The plan of it is God. The executor of the plan is God. The sustainer of it is God. The finisher of that work is God. It is not man. It is God whose love we have trampled by our sin, but it is God who brings us the good news. And the news is that he loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, we read this uh, a while back, but God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners. This is of God and of no one else. God the Father, he orchestrated all this for, for us because he loves us. This was promised through the prophets and, and this was promised through the prophets and Jesus Christ was born of the seed of David. The promise of the good news of God did not start at the birth of the Savior. The promise of the good news of the gospel of God started in the Old Testament through the prophets where God would reveal this message to his people through his messengers. All the prophets spoke about this coming Messiah that would come one day. Isaiah, we read in Isaiah 53, you know, surely he has borne our griefs, he has carried our sorrows talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. In Micah chapter five and verse two we read, uh, though you are little among thousands, talking about Bethlehem, uh, where our Lord would be born, yet out of you shall come forth to me one to be the ruler of Israel, whose going forth is from old and from everlasting. The message of the Messiah did not begin in the New Testament, but it began from times old and was revealed to mankind through the prophets. Jesus Christ himself in Luke chapter 24, when the two on the road to Emmaus were going forth and were, were so dejected because uh, the grave is empty, Jesus Christ has disappeared, the Lord Jesus Christ would tell them something and this is what he had to tell them. Ought not Christ have suffered these things and entered into his glory? And then we read, beginning with Moses 
and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all scriptures concerning himself, concerning Christ Jesus. So this is uh, revealed in the Old Testament through the prophets. This is nothing new. And then we read um, in verse 3, this is concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David. And verse 4, and declared to be son of God with power. Now the good news of, is of Jesus Christ, as uh, was uh, repeatedly mentioned, it is concerning his person and his work. But look at the two words that are used there, the qualifying verbs, so to speak. A born of the seed of David, declared to be son of God. Born of the seed of David. In uh, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, we read, For unto us a son is born, or a child is born, unto us a son is given. As a child he was born, and as a son he was given. In his humanity he was born, made according to the flesh, born of a woman, but in his Godhead he was declared, he was given, he was sent forth. He was and is the God-man. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23, we read, Behold, the virgin shall be with a child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, our God with us. He was the Son of God, the God-man. He was born of the seed of David, is what we read uh, in this passage, born of the seed of David. And again, this is no surprise uh, to the Old Testament saints as well as the New Testament. Uh, it was prophesied in the Old Testament that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would come through the lineage of David. In Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 5, we read, Raised up to David a righteous branch, a king. In Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 10, we would read, Out of the root of Jesse will stand, uh, a root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the people. That is, through Jesse would come forth to David. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, talking to David, uh, the Lord God of heaven would say this through the prophets. In 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 12, we read like this, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. But he shall build a house for my name and I'll establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Yes, he was speaking about David's son Solomon. Yes, he would reign. But would he reign forever? Absolutely not. The Lord God of heaven revealed the secret truth that the Messiah would come through the lineage of David and he would sit as king forever on the throne of David. And we read in this passage um, that this was according to the spirit of holiness. According to the spirit of holiness. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 11, we read, If the spirit of Christ who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. It is the spirit of God that was the agent in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit was involved, uh, the triune God uh, we see in this passage. By the resurrection, so, so the Holy Spirit, the agent of the resurrection, uh, by the resurrection from the dead is what we read in this passage. By the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection of Christ Jesus is the ultimate proof that he is the Son of God. Death cannot keep his prey. Jesus, my Savior, he tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose as a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. And because the grave is empty, that is the ultimate proof that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Always when uh, 
Christ Jesus when he was on the earth, when he prophesied, and you can look up many references in the uh, New Testament. Whenever he mentioned about his death that was to come, he would accompany that with hope by telling the people that he was telling this to, including his disciples, that he would rise up on the third day, that he would be a resurrected savior and not a savior that was dead. So verse five, uh, now we see saving and sustaining grace. In verse five we read, through him, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all the nations for his name. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. We see personal grace before true service. Personal grace. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship. Grace, again, is undeserved favor. Undeserved favor, something that I received from the Lord God of heaven when I did not deserve it. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and uh, verse 9 and 10, we read, I'm the least of the apostles, and this is talking about Paul, and uh, him, uh, you know, uh, just going over his you know, what he felt, oh wretched man that I am, as we looked at earlier today. Uh, we read in verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 15, For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But verse 10 we read, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace towards me is not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. It was the grace of God that sustained Paul. It is the grace of God that came down and saved Paul, and it is the grace of God that continues to sustain Paul. He was overwhelmed by the grace that was provided on Calvary Street. And it's not just a saving grace, but God also promises us sustaining grace. Saving grace and sustaining grace. Uh, Paul uh, would go, go on in, in uh, 2 Corinthians and chapter 12. Uh, he would talk about a thorn that was in his flesh. And he prayed about this thorn in the flesh. We don't know what the thorn in the flesh was, but we know that it was very thorny. And uh, he would uh, pray that this thorn be removed from him. And the answer from the Lord God of heaven was no. But he provided this. He said to Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I'd rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ might rest upon me. He not just saves us by his grace and not of our works. He not just provides us this free gift in Jesus Christ, but through him, he sustains us by his grace. Grace upon grace we have received. My grace is sufficient for you. So what is our response to the grace of God and the calling of God? What is our response? Obedience to faith. And we see this phrase in uh, verse 5. Uh, to, he has called us, uh, he has bought us, uh, all these things, he has given us grace uh, and, and to the obedience of faith. And this, this is seen repeatedly uh, in the book of Romans and in, in the end of Romans 2 in Romans chapter 16 and verse 9, 26 we read uh, of the obedience of faith of the saints. You can have obedience without faith and faith without obedience, but you need both. We are not saved so that we can have a set of theological principles in our head, but rather we are saved to surrender to the Christ, uh, to Christ our Savior. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10, we read, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. And there is one more thing about... Um, you know, uh, obedience of faith. He has called us into faith. He, he desires for us to be obedient to the faith that he has called us into. And he also promises us that 
this faith and this obedience to faith will only lead to a blessing and not a curse. And this obedience to faith is not burdensome. In 1 John chapter 5, we read uh, in verse 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. His commandments are not burdensome. So submitting in unhindered obedience to the word of God only produces blessing, and it's not burdensome. Obedience of faith is to be occupied with Christ Jesus so that he permeates our whole life. Moving on, uh, we see the spear of obedience. We see the spear of obedience. And, and in this verse, we see among all nations for his name. The door of his grace is open to all. It's not just to you and I, but to everyone, the world, for God so loved the world. The saints are to go and proclaim the excellencies of the one that called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. His awesomeness, his great work for us, his mighty acts, his glorious splendor, proclaiming that to all the nations. And that is what God has provided. He has provided it to all. The spear of obedience to all nations so that they would come to Christ and they would be sustained by his grace. And the purpose of it all, we read, it's for his name. In the book of Malachi, we saw how the people during Malachi's time despised and rejected the name of Christ. But here is a call through the Gospels to glorify Christ Jesus. It is all about his beautiful name. All the grace provided, all the apostleship received by Paul, the obedience to this faith, the faith in itself is all for the sake of his name. And in closing, uh, we see the blessings of being in Christ Jesus. The blessings of being in Christ Jesus. In verse 6 we read, Among whom you are called of Jesus Christ. And verse 7, To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the words that he uses are marvelous. A beloved of God, called to be saints, of grace and peace. God so loved the world is what we read, but he always refers to his own, that is them that are redeemed as beloved of God. And how special is that for us as saints? He calls us saints. We were once sinners. Uh, we were wretched sinners, as Paul would call it. But now we are redeemed by his grace, and we are called saints, a sinner saved by grace. And that is what a saint is. It's not uh, someone uh, like, in the, uh, uh, like in some of the churches where in order for someone to be bestowed the honor of a saint, uh, they have to go through so many different rituals, so many different investigations before uh, their name is cleared and before they are given the name saint. But the moment we are saved and brought in to the household of God through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are called saints. And Paul addresses the Roman, Roman church as saints of Christ Jesus, called to be saints. To every saint belongs grace and peace, the grace that is sufficient, the sustaining grace. And peace of God which passeth all understanding, which keeps our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Again, sustaining grace, sustaining peace, these are all the blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. So to end it all, uh, going back to our summary or the bottom line up front and now at the end, the gospel is of God. The center is in Christ Jesus. Its purpose is for his glory and its blessing is for you and me called to be saints. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your marvelous work on Calvary Street. We thank you for your grace that came down and saved us. We thank you for your sustaining grace that continues to sustain us. 
all the love that drew salvation's plan, all the love that brought it down to man. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Father, we thank you for him. Help us, Lord, as we go forth, that uh, we would proclaim the excellencies of Christ Jesus, that we would be as born servants, as slaves of Christ, that they would see Christ Jesus in us and be drawn to the Savior and to his love. And if there is anyone here today, Lord, that do not know you, Father, we pray that you would work in their hearts, that they would see the need for righteousness that only God can provide in and through his Son. And Father, we pray that you would continue to work, not just in their hearts, but in ours as well, for your kingdom and for your glory. We give you thanks. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.